Gardner Cole Miller is a curator, educator, artist, and working or artist working in fiber, ceramics, and mixed media installations. Currently teaching at Broward College in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Cole received his MFA from Florida International University in 2014. Cole has exhibited with the Vast Museum of Art, David Castillo Gallery, Art Fields, and many more. His work resides in the permanent collection of the Frost Art Museum and among numerous private collections. He was also the curator and assistant director of this little place called the Sumter County Gallery <laughs> uh, between 2016 and 2022. So without any further ado, and again, a lot of thanks to everybody here, please give a warm Sumter welcome to Sylvia Patel, the Garden of the <laughs> I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm only a little nervous and kind of like you to inspire my own personal God here. <laughs> As a fiber artist, filter myself, meeting Sylvia when I moved to Sumter in 2016, legendary, legendary. I was told I had to, and once I did, unforgettable. Eric Waltman told you that too, didn't he? Yeah. Because <laughs> he told me I had to be you. <laughs> this one owns one of my quilts. Uh, but I think I really wanted to jump in, uh, just kind of touching on, I, probably because I'm two days on to my holiday break right now, from teaching, <laughs> and so the school stuff is still thoroughly in my mind, uh, but I love that you take the time to mention the Whitney exhibition in abstract design and American quilting. Uh, it, it's a game changer. It changed the entire notion of how the wider world perceives this art form. And it was in 1972. I'm not. That was kind of a, a misprint, I guess. But the um, they mounted that exhibit in 1972. And where was I in 72? I, I didn't learn about it until much later. But um, yeah, it, it's what made quilts art. I mean, mm -hmm. that's. You could now sell your stuff. You, if you were a, a, a fiber artist, you could sell your stuff. I, I mean, there was always an underground um, group mm -hmm. that were art quilters, fiber or textile artists, and, and and you probably heard or read about some of those. And then they were able to bring their stuff to. Um, to shows and, and be recognized by galleries so that they could put their stuff um, up for sale. Then, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, there is a very, I'm going to lose my words, it's at the um, cow barn up in Ohio. And it's a um, <laughs> every two year exhibit of the most, and they're invited and curated and curated into, I mean, fiber art now is a big, big industry. There's um, magazines and, I mean, you can't, they're expensive. Oh yeah, I mean, so <laughs> just, just kind of connecting with your writing about your own career, your practice, your clothing. It was kind of non-existent prior to that moment in the late 80s, or middle 80s, right. no Joanne's and things like that. No, Stitchers. I mean, I made all of my clothes. I made all of my children's clothes up until wow. um, my daughter got into high school and, you know, that wasn't good. <laughs> anyway, she wouldn't wear clothes. <laughs> I made my own clothes. I would wear my own clothes and she wouldn't wear them. But um, as a Stitcher, yeah, you were you were a stitcher. I was a stitcher. Um, that's relating to the the artist thing. Oh, sure, yeah, because yeah, I don't. When I grew up in a small town in North Louisiana, um, there was no art. I never been. I don't think I ever went to an art museum until I was married and we were in Germany, and I went to see the Guggenheim Bible in somewhere in Germany. Also went to the, I think it's the Rice Museum that oh, has yeah, the yeah, Night Watch, yeah. Yeah. Um, the Louvre. I got to see Mona Lisa. I had, that was in the mm, 70s, uh, 1969, 1970. I was born in 1941. That was the first time I'd ever been to an art museum. So I, I we didn't have art. I didn't study art. I didn't know art. Mm. I made clothes. Mm -hmm. I. 
that's not art. That's things you wear. So that's, I, I still have a, a trouble, I, I have trouble with it. I create um, what I see, something that inspires me. People call that art now because <laughs> there was a bunch of Amish quilts put on the wall in 1972 by the Whitney Museum. So now we're artists. And it's not like, <laughs> it's it's not like the art world needed to be ready for that in a way. It's not like quilting was ever kind of, you know, Exactly. It's, it comes out and things like that. The art world still book. has problems with this. Oh, yes. Just, I oh, mean, yes. Fiber is not, it's just like photography is not an art, ceramics is not an art, fiber and textiles are not an art. To some people who grew up with drawing and painting is art. And, and that's, that's, that was instilled into the into the minds of so many. I mean, you can still even work in education, the discrepancy between what is art and what is craft. Because um, when we started the conversation to prepare for this, I was referring to you exclusively as an artist, just kind of falling back into my old patterns of working with artists. And you kind of put the brakes on that. And I'm a crafter. I'm that. a stitcher. I'm a crafter. Um, that's how I feel about myself, which is, you know, that's. If somebody else wants to consider it art and wants to buy it and pay the prices, then buy it. <laughs> 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 don't up on the terms there. Yeah, I don't know. We're not what I really love, what you mentioned, and sort of brought it back around to, you really credit, as the true artist, the original designers, inventors of these patterns, motifs, the people who then perpetuate these. You guys know that history repeats itself. Yeah. You know that. I mean, we, we come around and around and around. There is nothing on these walls that wasn't first Put out and oh my God, how you know in the, in BC or something oh, yeah. mosaics in in ancient Rome, Jerusalem, everywhere. yeah, quilt patterns. Those are quilt <laughs> patterns that I use that are published in books now. Man, those things were on the floors of, of Pompeii. <laughs> um, wood and and I think Eric knows more about furniture maybe than I do. But you know, a canthus leaf, that's a, a traditional wood um, design mm -hmm. that's carved into um, furniture. Well, it's also what the Greeks used to, to decorate things. The Corinthian capitals, yes. Yeah. Absolutely, same motif. And so, I guess my real question for you, or I wonder what you think about this, is how do you locate yourself within that trajectory, within that tradition? Do you feel a responsibility to all of those previous makers and crafters? <laughs> do you feel like you've got to almost kind of mind your P's and Q's, or do you feel that it allows you enough room to innovate, sort of bury that tradition? Everybody innovates. Okay. From the very beginning, I mean, Let's go back to the mosaics on the floor in, in Pompeii. Um, we're innovating to, you look at my scrap quilts and you look at those mosaics and you're gonna see that same thing from, from say BC into the 1890s into the 1930s. You're gonna see the same thing, but different. And then you get into what, 20, 20s, and you start seeing the same things, but now they're called modern because we have given them um, a lack of color, or we have expanded the space, or we have done something so that now we can call it modern, but Man, it is so tied back to that. Um, what I mean, the perfect example of what you're talking about is evidence here on the table. Yeah. It's almost what the previous generation, or the uh, subsequent generations imagine about the previous, in a way. Uh, it is. Referring it, to some of the fabrics that you brought in, which, yeah. by the way, we have amazing people spread here tonight, which we're happy we get to talk about all the people talking about. I don't want to distract us too much. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, it, um, so in terms of innovation, um, is that something that is collaborative with some of the earlier makers in terms of building upon that tradition? Yeah, um, 19, go back into 1800s, they had fabrics that they made beautiful things out of that were special, but they had scraps that if you are familiar with um, the, the um, 
G G Ben. Oh, G Ben, yeah. G's Ben quilters, which is a group of African American quilters, they use the leftover scraps of what, and, and they bring that culture with them from where they came from, out of Africa. Oh, yeah. That's the, the, the mindset, but they took those scraps that were left on the floor of the Sears Roebuck factory creating, and, and they have done what they're, they're doing with. But I lost the train of thought. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I can almost either throw this away because you're bringing up so many more interesting things to talk about. Because we talk about tradition, but there isn't just a singular tradition of quilting, I feel. It comes depending on your own era. era. It depends on when the era. It, what? It, and even re regional, I think, as well. Is that yeah. something you think is um, present in your life? I have found out in, in, in thinking about this and in thinking about what I've done that I am a creature of whatever is happening at that time because, oh, I like that. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, look at all that fabric. Well, you know, I was traveling all around and going to all these shows and you see a lot of things. And then, I was <laughs> talking a little, little bit earlier, that quilt has nylon thread on it. <laughs> ah, <laughs> that is one of the, and, and I'm gonna, this is the biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes that a quilter can make because um, fibers, you know, your textiles, and when you put a needle in it, number one, you're gonna abrade that fiber. So you're creating a hole. Then you come along and you use fishing line. <laughs> <laughs> Does not die. <laughs> Never. But it was marketed as, Honey, this oh. is gonna get judged oh, wow. because they can't see the imperfections in your stitches. <laughs> and I fell into that trap big time. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I can make, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take these Amish, you know, I, I never made an Amish quilt. I wanted to make an Amish quilt. I'm going to um, use this other thing that came out about the same time as these Amish quilts did, and that's that nylon thread. And I don't that so I'm a I'm a creature of whatever is happening at the time. <laughs> uh, if we get to now and and I love scrap quilts. Mm -hmm. I adore scrap quilts. So that's where my ties come in. Okay. Well, well I was gonna say too, I've just could sort of define for everybody what a quilt is. And I always I never oh. thought to do that until I found your amazing description of that going from just so, uh, I wish I could quote you here. If you just go ahead. Okay. All right. So, uh, as for Sylvia, I just if anybody's not one hundred percent sure what a quilt is, a uh, quilt is three layers of anything held together by some method. I once saw a piece of clear vinyl stuffed with dryer lint and stapled to a cloth backing, displayed as an art quilt. Uh, so it's anything layering. It's essentially really the it's layering. Thing. I mean, metaphor behind yeah, um, if you think back into the Middle Ages, the armor that was used on the horses was quilts. Mm -hmm. It was quilt fabric. It was double, you know, padded stuff. But yeah, yeah. Well, and so kind of building on that idea of quilt, what a quilt is essentially a fair kind of level and all those themes of tradition. And a little bit we're already talking about this work because this is, <laughs> first of all, I stopped in my tracks when I came in here because it's, 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 it's big. <laughs> well, it's a lot of swaths of color. It's a really powerful work. It also, it, it, you, know, you really do engage with the tradition of Amish quilting here. I mean, there are works like in the collection of the Met in New York that look almost exactly like this. And so really working within that vernacular tradition. Um, and so I love the title, Only God Makes a Perfect Quilt, just kind of going back to that Amish idea. Um, the Amish, because they are Amish, put a mistake in their quilts. Everything they make is has got a mistake because only God can make a perfect quilt. And yeah, that's traditionally the, the Amish. If I'm gonna make an Amish quilt, then I've got to make a quilt that's got a yeah, yeah, very distinctive mistake. And there's the distinctive mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and over there you have something different. Yeah. 
Thank you. I've been looking. 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 i have been looking 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 i have been looking
and I'm going to put all of these blocks together, and I'm going to make a quilt, and then I'm going to publish these books, and your quilt will be in it, your blocks will be in it, and so forth and so on. And that was what I was doing in those, that I entered every contest, magazines had these contests all the time, make a block. Well, you know, make a block. If you're 12 inches, 15 inches, you can do whatever you want to, you know. So this was right down my alley. So I did three or four and I sent them to her and she was just blown away. Oh my God, I've never seen such gorgeous work and blah, 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 blah. And we, you know, come work for me. So I did, I did a lot of work on pieces that she then published. She gives great credit, she has great photos. She's always been a really, really good friend. Um, now I've forgotten what we were talking about. The oh, well, yes, it's the background so, reading that. <laughs> so yeah, yes. that's how come to me that was tradition in an 18 or 1980. I had to start. It was in 1986 that the, the contest was. So I started in 1985. I thought this is the most gorgeous thing in the world. There's not any of these around mm -hmm. now. I will just create the most gorgeous one that they could. Uh, you know, and it's going to win this contest. Mm -hmm. And so there were two uh, two quilts selected from each state by an in-state judge. In other words, South Carolina was mine and the lady in green one. Well, she did, I don't know what her name was, but I did like her quilt. Um, <laughs> it was, she was from the mountains, so she did um, a delectable mountains <clears throat> pattern. I mean, it wasn't original, it was just, well, it was original to her. It was a traditional pattern. And, um, so all 150 states, 100 quilts were, were selected to go to New York City to hang uh, for the judging, and there were like five national judges, and you know, I waited, I waited, and I waited, and I thought, well, I'm not getting a telephone call, I'm not getting a telephone call. And I called Ellie, um, and I said, Ellie, uh, what, what have you heard? And she said, well, um, they, they've selected a winner, you haven't heard anything. I said, no, I haven't heard anything. Um, don't understand this. Not sure what's going on. Well, anyway, it turned out I didn't win anything. I didn't even get first place in the state. The other girl, she was considered the first place winner, and her quilt was in all of the publications, but these are the state winners. And then I got a letter, at, well, actually, I got a call, telephone call from the Museum of American Folk Art, and it said, we love your quilt. We want to put it in our exhibit. Um, liberties with liberty, and we're going to tour this quilt for two years. And I thought it was a spam call. I won't <laughs> <laughs> the world. <laughs> Are these people calling me and they want my quilt to tour in the museum? No way. So you have to realize this was a very small community. If you went to quilt shows in the 80s, you knew everybody. And I called Lady at Quilters Newsletter Magazine, who was my friend, who I had written stuff for their publication. They, you know, and I said, <coughs> Do I believe these people or not? And she said, Sweetheart, if you've got a call from the Museum of American Folk Art, you probably need to tell them yes. <laughs> so that baby, she's been published and, and she toured. And then the other group that was really big at that time, this was the beginning of the American Quilting Society at Paducah. Yeah. And they sent, they didn't send, they just put a big ad in something, I don't remember what, but we're not accepting any of the quilts that went to the Statue of Liberty contest into our show in April because we are not going to host another show oh, of okay. the Liberty Quilts. <clears throat> ah, well, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and not only had I cried for like a week because they didn't, you know, spent hours on this. Oh, thousands, I think. It's thousands of yes. hours in yeah. research. Yeah. And the only thing I had to do, I couldn't even find a picture of the Statue of Liberty in research mm. at the library. Mm. So, wow, that's not me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> so, 
So anyway, it was a lot of research, and um, uh, and it did get to go to. I did have a few other shows um, around the country that it traveled to, so it got it it got displayed. Um, well, then, so I guess that kind of leads me to my very next question, which oh, is the piece of Succession by the museum. Yes, so, yes. This this just tore me up. I, I, not only did I cry, but I just, you know, I didn't understand it. Traditional quilting had just been replaced by all of these, you know, really modern, and they weren't modern to the sense that of, of modern now, but they were not traditional quilts that we were in this contest. And so I got angry and I took all of my, there again, I'm still using cross making fabrics or, you know, fabrics for clothing. And I threw them all down on the floor and um, created what's called uh, Escape from Circle City. Yes. And there's a picture of it here on the yes. table. And everything is circular. And inside the circles are of um, traditional cooking designs. And I got it made in time for taking it to the show Logan Lap Quilters, which was the group that I belonged to at that time. It was not a quilt group in Sumter. So my friend Jan Adler, who is um, Heidi Adler's mom, we were quilt buddies and we went to, to the quilt club, quilt camp, and all in Columbia. It's, it's a tradition. It's uh, tongue in cheek, okay. toss down of uh, traditional quilting, and I never made. I did, I'll take that back. I did make one traditional quilt after that, and it was for Jocelyn Butler, because she she wanted a, a, a grandma quilt. That, that's what I call it, grandma quilt. Um, Starburst, I think, but those are some of the fabrics. <coughs> and so the, so the Escape from Circle City really represents a break with tradition I for you and your process. Yeah. I never went back to, because then following Escape from Circle City, the Shazam, um, uh, the red one, the red one that's back there. Um, Come on, baby, light my fire. The red and yellow one. Yeah. So then that takes me about to the time when I stopped quilting and went to work. <laughs> because I had people to support. Oh. <laughs> I had a kid. Quilting does not pay the bills always. Oh God, no. no. Oh, and that's that's another thing. These people that march around the country all of the time and give lectures and and show you all of these things because they're now the famous people that won the contest. They don't create anymore. Mm -hmm. Because you come home to, you know, dirty dishes and dirty clothes, sink full, sink full of dishes and kids, and you don't, you don't create anymore. Once you've gone out on the circuit <laughs> um, to lecture and, you know, demonstrate and all of that kind of stuff, then, then you no longer come home and want to create. That's all, that's all there is to it. Oh, yeah, that teaching part? Uh, like, you know what, after grading all those papers? You don't, you, I bet you haven't made anything in ages, have you? It's a slow process. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happened to, to like, Dragon. It, it got started, um, Sharon did. They both got started back in, you know, those, before I went to work. And they didn't get so finished. Did. Sharon Stead. Didn't you show that at the guild show while I was here? So that, so we're talking like years on these props, on these pieces. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> they were wrapped up, and and they were in partial process. And the truth about Sharon's net is, um, Raven, the the same colors you see the the burgundy and the in the tree. Once upon a time, Sharon's net was the center medallion of those colors around it. And it was to be a very Baltimore-ish type because I wanted to go away from the traditional Baltimore into those tones of reds or blues, greens, whatever, and then something else. Well, that it 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 never worked. 
I took Sharon's net out of the center and entered it into Gil Show, and it was, it was another honorable mention. I'm pretty sure I got another honorable mention. And then finally, this year, like this year, the rest of the fabrics that were left from Sharon's net that were around it, um, I don't like to leave things undone. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened to the rest of the fabrics. This lady. And she looks good. She looks good. Yeah. She looks better than yeah. She looks better than she did when she was part of that. <laughs> um, but dragon, dragon was just the center part because at that time when that was done, that was also the time when you know people were dyeing fabrics and creating their own fabrics. So um, there's some the, the original fabrics were, that are in dragon are here. Um, I use Clorox on the greens to yeah. Don't do that. It's, 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 you have to be very careful when you use chemicals like that on, on textiles because it's going to rot. I think it's kind of what I really connect to in so many of the works is just being a fiber artist myself, reading your own bio, hearing about the stash, which we've all got one. If you are a sewing person at all, you know you've got some. Uh, I love that you intervene on the fabric yourself. It's very hand of the artist, even if you know not where you're using the word. Uh, but there is painting, there is dyeing. Um, so much of that really just reveals your own kind of process, your own connection to the materials. And so I was wondering, how did you maybe get into that, or what inspired that? Because that's not something I don't think, at least not I, I don't usually associate that with. Back to things. what's going on around you at the mm -hmm. present time, and what, what strikes you, and what makes you want to do something. There again, that's going to all those shows and seeing all those people. Oh my God, you know, dying all of these different, uh, things and creating batik like fabrics, mm -hmm. you know, um, marbling. Marbling was all. Oh, yeah, marbling, big summer art camp piece that you're Oh, doing. man, <laughs> was that a big thing? But those pieces were created when I taught in 1992, I think, is when I was teaching at, at art camp at the Ellis White House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. Those pieces are sat in, in a box waiting for something to, what am I going to do with it? Mm. And you know, that's what I did with it. I just put all the pieces together, <laughs> put them together, and it's art camp. Well, in addition to the fabrics that you work with, you also have been working lately, I think, with like fabric objects, so the ties, for example. Um, and we see that over here, and I love that you brought one to show us how you're taking some art. You people don't know what ties can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what you see, you know, you see a nice, ugly dress, gentleman, and you've got this tie on. Ties are splashy because they are designed to be worn against a white or light blue or something like that. That's what men's wear is. So um, they're always going to be splashy and shiny. Not all of them are silk, some of them are polyester. But um, back in the 80s, there was a lady that gave a lecture at one of these court shows, and her guild had made her a skirt out of men's ties. And they were all Lined up like this. And I thought, oh, that's such a cute idea. I think I want to do that. So um, I came home, and the SPCA back in the 80s had a little, one of their side rooms was a, a, a little gift shop, thrift shop, oh, not a gift shop, thrift shop. And I was in there with one of the animals, and um, they had ties, and I thought, oh, I'm going to give me some of those ties because one of these days I'm going to do something like that. I'm going to make me a skirt or something like that. And then, um, Somebody else gave me a bag of, of used ties, and those things sat in getting moved around in some box somewhere since the 80s. And then I thought, what year was it? 20, 2008. I'm going to show you what these ties can do for you. Um, you take them apart, and you've got this huge, big piece of fabric. You've got this, which is upcoming next year, we're going to start using these guys. And I'm going to dye some of them, and I'm going to do 
various and sundry things with them. Then you've got these lovely little pieces here that also, so for a dollar at the thrift store, I have just created or, or purchased, you know, a whole lot of stuff to do something with. So in 2008, Peggy Chilcutt had, she was doing, um, Accessibility. Oh, Accessibility. A fall for the arts. Oh, and that was fall with the arts, fall for the arts. Accessibility. Um, she got a group of, of local artists together, and she wanted to create a, a fashion show type thing. And oh, we were all excited. And I went out to the local uh, consignment store, and I found eleven men's tuxedo jackets. So I decided I was going to create all these variety of, um, Jack, I had a, a biker with I thought a black leather skirt, so that I had a um, suede jacket, I had a cowboy, anyway, I made all of these things, and I sent this proposal to Peggy, and she said, you know, all of these things I had made, part to wear, and she said, well, I'm sorry, but the person that uh, has, has been hired to come in and she's bringing all of her own um, stitchers and they're gonna create this blah, 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 blah. So here I am left with this uh, eight pieces of art to wear and here comes Laura Cardillo. She's working at USC and she says, we'd like to show your art to wear. And I said, oh, I'm delighted because I've got all these tuxedo jackets. And then I decided, you know what else I'm gonna make? I'm gonna make myself a jacket out of some of those ties. And that's the one I wore at the, at the, at the opening. That's funny. My tie is the name of that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so then in, in 2010, I've still got these, these ties and I'm still, don't know what to do with these ties. I made a, a piece for the Guild Show. And I, it's, it's kind of, didn't, I, it didn't appeal to me and it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, what I really always wanted to do was create a Victorian crazy quilt. Oh. Because they use silks oh, and velvets, oh. and, velvets mm -hmm. and beautiful embroidery. And I thought, well, why can't I do that with ties? Well, ties, you don't find solid ties. What you find, which is what Victorian pieces, oh, the embroidery is the design, mm -hmm. not the, the design of the, of the, of the textile. Um, so they're really hard to make a crazy quilt from because you've got so much going on in the textile itself that it's just adding something to it doesn't work. Um, so I still haven't done a real crazy quilt, but I tried in 2010 when I made about six uh, quilts from the ties in that sort of uh, and using them like scrap quilt if you if you do any research into scrap quilts they just cut pieces of fabric that are stitched together and oh yeah foundation piece sometimes yeah. you quilt. oh yes but that's pretty much the ties still well, I have a lot to do I, mean, I love that there's still more coming up from the oh. ties like stay tuned stay tuned yeah yeah. Well, and I think on that note, first of all, I just got to say thank you so much for your generosity in spending time with us tonight, for sharing not just the history, but so many of your secrets as well <laughs> as a creator. Um, and if you don't have not spent time, and you haven't yet because we haven't let you so far, but there will be time. Um, everything you brought tonight, Sylvia, I mean, just really helps us to understand your process, really appreciate just your contribution to this medium. All of the publications are here, all of the steps along the way, the examples, the examples. I mean, it's a really holistic experience. I'm, it, people who are here today are so lucky. I think you're <laughs> once, it, it, I wouldn't say it's a lifetime because you deserve so many more opportunities to share this with the world. You have had so many, and I love that. But y'all, this is special. I'm so glad you're here for it. Thank you for being here. And so with that, thank you. And if anybody has any questions, we would love to hear them. Yes, John, please. Yes, John. Well, Sylvia, yes. Um, now, you call yourself a stitcher, so I'm just wondering, because we talked about your upbringing in North Louisiana. But when you were growing up, were you used to seeing women hand sew, or were you used to watching women, uh, or I'm assuming, you know, 
know, in the household. And so, uh, did they have a sewing machine? Did you care about it? Or My grandma sewed everything she wore on her treadle machine. When I was in home economics in high school in the 50s, there was one treadle machine, and the rest were with the hands. That's what yeah, the singer that everybody has. The singer, yeah. 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 So everybody's at the table now. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, but was that was that passed on to you? Um, you know, it, just, it probably was. I just my mother had one of the little small singers because she made my baby clothes. But she also made she pieced. I know in the 30s, it, I graduated from high school in, in 1935, and I know that she pieced a quilt from the, the 1930s clothing that she had, had worn. Um, so I, it, was, it was in my life. I don't know that, I know grandma taught me how to how to sew on the treadle machine, but I was in high school then, and <clears throat> I wanted to learn how to sew on the treadle machine so that I could have time in class. Uh, I was the only one that knew how to use the treadle machine. Everybody else opted out for the electric machines. Oh. But when you've only got five machines and you've got a class of 12 people. Can you explain that? Because I mean, I remember that. Oh, is it a you you just do this. That's what you do. You rock that, and that causes the needle to go up and down. And, and you have to. God, years ago, John, I'm eight years old. That was <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, when I was ten and I joined the 4-H club here again, you guys a very small farming town in the sixties. It, very um, close knit type town. Um, you didn't walk out your house without the neighbor wanting to know where you were going. Yeah. Um, 4-H club was a way for us to get away. Those of us that <laughs> wanted to get away. I mean, a lot of people lived on, on the farms and they, you know, went with their families and stayed into the farming. I was a townie. There were, like, very few townies. All of my friends lived, you know, out in the country. Um, I wanted to get away. I, 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 that, this was my opportunity. I mean, I entered, you know, all of the 4-H competitions. Learned how to sew, learned how to talk myself. I'm, I'm a very, is it alpha, a, a, a type, a type of personality? No. <laughs> no, 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 kid, no. You go back to the 4-H club. They gave ribbons and they gave money. I was 12 years old and I made $3 because I entered this apron in in this contest, and I got a blue ribbon, and I got three dollars. I'm 12 years old, and I, you know, I I didn't have an allowance because then we couldn't afford to give me an allowance. But if I can make money entering the competitions, <laughs> nothing ain't gonna stop me now. <laughs> but yeah, it, it it's part of my background. John has one of my quotes too. Yes, I do. <laughs> the companion to the one. Yeah. Oh. And I think, um, you know, thinking back on um, Cookie's exhibition, oh, the yes. epic Stitchers, I think Stitchers yeah. is a badge that um, maybe. It is a badge. That, yeah. that, that quilters or so, you know, wear proudly. Yes. You know, because that's the basis. Um, everything. And you'd ask these people, how many of them don't have a stitch? And very few do. So yes, it is a badge. You hadn't thought about it that way, Karen. Yeah. I'd like to say, too, teaching 3D design to college students, Ooh. people making things with their hands, that it's like a boring concept. <laughs> 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 
ones. I don't know which ends. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any uh, questions? Is the dragon oh. ever going to be for sale? No. <laughs> I like to say her. I have a question. Um, everybody has one. What's your most unorthodox piece and why? Everybody no, unorthodox. Yeah. I don't think it's here. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Everything. Not everything. A, a lot of things are unorthodox when I do them. If you look, the uh, snake in the grass. That's taking. That's that's nothing except that saying. There's a snake in the grass, and how am I going to put that on a quilt? There's also a song. Um, of the, about an ant climbing up a leaf. You, you know the song I'm talking about? I can't remember. It's like rubber, rubber, tree rubber, tree rubber tree plant. That's it, yeah. rubber tree plant. Uh -huh. this, is, this is how I conceptualize things, things come into mind. Okay, I want, I want a rubber tree plant, but I want a snake in the grass, and I've got all of this fabric, and I don't have a pattern, and I'm just gonna cut I threw it on a piece of paper, kind of leaves, and then that is all freely cut, freely stitched. That takes me clearly away from patterning into, and that was probably the first one like that I did, where I gave myself the freedom to Cut into something without a pattern, and then Tracy's Bohemian one back there, which <laughs> that's Bayou, that's my concept of what a Louisiana Bayou looks like, where I've taken these watery looking fabrics. Um, I, I guess that's the things I, to me, that are unorthodox because you come out of that traditional patterning and, and you have to go somewhere where you're not comfortable. And Micah in the orange <laughs> hat was in here the other day and said how much you love it. That, that one grabbed me. It's, it's great. I grew up in South Mississippi. Oh, and, honey. And, oh, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's fantastic. Oh, cool. And the skill, obviously, is so apparent in what you're doing, but the color theory in that one, I think, here is so Here we go back. See, so now, I'm, this color thing. Yeah. Yeah, John and I had this conversation yeah, about this color thing. Um, when I took the courses to, to do the um, judging, certified quilt judge, you take these different kind of things that you have to recognize when you're judging a, 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 tag, a, a quilt. And they're just kind of natural in, in the way I see things. I like right colors. Um, and I like things that kind of shout out at you. Just like Rhonda said, I must have been on something high when I made that butterfly. Yes. <laughs> like how many Cheech and Chong movies she watched. That's, <laughs> that's the textiles that were available. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, but this is a traditional patterning that the pattern is kaleidoscope and I and if you see a kaleidoscope pattern it's very rigidly um, it's not it's, it's not why I like this this is where I took a lot of my blacks and my um, I've got some of my Java textiles in here some batiks wax resist we went on a cruise I want a cruise <laughs> On a cruise to the Caribbean islands and in um, Puerto Rico in the town square. <laughs> and there were fabric vendors and they were selling wax resist. Mm -hmm. If you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wax resist textiles. Um, mm -hmm. That's a 